Hello students, it's your history teacher and I'm here with another online lecture and this is the very last one for the school year. So I will continue what I stopped during the last lecture. So on the page 245 in your book, History is Not a Mystery. And the first topic will be the second, resistance. So after the Munich Agreement and the creation of Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia and Slovak State, many people emigrated and they started to create foreign centers of Czechoslovak resistance. The two most important centers were in London and Moscow. In London there was center of democratic resistance and in Moscow of communist resistance. There were also many people living in Warsaw and Paris for example. But these two, London and Moscow, were the most important. You know, the main goal of both of these centers was the liberation and recreation of the Czechoslovak Republic. After the war started, Warsaw and Paris were occupied by Nazi Germany and so only these two centers stayed in the game. As I mentioned, London was the center of democratic resistance. So this was the place where the Czechoslovak government, based on democratic principles, was recreated. Okay, Because we can say that our former government of Czechoslovakia fled to London and it was an exile there. The head of that government was President Edward Beneš, the one that I mentioned in the first Czechoslovak Republic. Okay, he, was, he used to be Minister of the Finances, now he was President. And apart from Czechoslovak government in London, the Czechoslovak forces were created in Great Britain as well. The famous was, for example, the role of the Czechs and Slovak as pilots in Royal Air Force, so RAF. Also, our soldiers were part of the Allied forces. And this was very important, you know, because this was used as an argument for the fact that we still wanted to be democratic Czechoslovakia and that only some group of people created Slovak state and protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia illegally, okay? And we still want to be on the side of the Allies. So this was very important. The next important thing that I will mention is the Operation Anthropoid. This operation was also organized by the exiled Czechoslovak government. Paratroopers Josef Gabčík and Jan Kubiš assassinated one of the most powerful Nazi leaders, Reinhard Heydrich, in May 1942. The main goal of that operation was to prove the Allies that we are still willing to fight the Nazi Germany at any cost. The assassination was successful, but after a long struggle. You know, there's a little mistake in the book. So after Gabčík's gun jammed, Kubiš attacked Heydrich's car with the grenade. Both fled successfully and Heydrich was wounded by the grenade and died because of an infection later in hospital. The assassins, Gabčík and Kubiš, and their companions were betrayed by another paratrooper, Karel Čurda, who was rewarded by the Nazis. The group was surrounded in the crypt of the St. Cyril and Methodius Cathedral in Prague, where they were hiding and waiting for the best chance to escape. But the group was surrounded in the crypt and after the fight all of them died. The reprisals after the assassination were very cruel. Best known is the destruction of two villages in Bohemia and these were Lezaki and Lidice. Innocent people were murdered and deported. Children were sent to the German families. So this was the price we paid for the assassination. And there are many questions if it was really necessary to be done. But the answer is that, you know, the Allies made us to do it because they were not sure if we are really on the side of the Allies and we are willing to fight for our country. Because, you know, the official government collaborated with the Nazis. So now it's easy to talk about other possibilities, but in fact, in that time, we can say it was unnecessary to do so. Dobre, čo z tejto stránky naozaj, čo si musíte pamätať, sú hlavné dve centra odboja, 
v Londýne a v Moskve. V Londýne demokratické, v Moskve komunistické. V Londýne sa nachádzala exilová československá vláda na čele s Edvardom Benešom a v Británii sa sformovali aj československé vojnové sily a napríklad aj naši piloti sa preslávili v kráľovskom britskom letectve. Z Británie bola vyslaná aj operácia Antropoid, ktorá mala spáchať atentát na tretieho najvyššieho nacistického činiteľa a ten bol Reinhard Heydrich, prezývaný aj pražský mesiar, ktorý bol v podstate na čele protektorátu Čechia Morava. A teda títo dvaja, ktorí boli určení na tú misiu, bol Jozef Gabčík Slovák a Jan Kubiš Čech. Misia bola úspešná, ale nakoniec sa teda týmto parašutistom nepodarilo uniknúť. A ako dôsledok tejto akcie boli vypálené a zničené dve dediny ležáky a lidice. Okay, so that's everything you need to know from this. And now we'll move to the Slovak national uprising. And here the most important things you need to remember from Slovak national uprising. What's that? There were these two centers, democratic in London and communist in Moscow. But they had the same goal. And so, in 1943, after all of the turning points of the 1942, when the Allies started to win the war, actually, the Christmas Agreement was signed between the two branches of the resistance. So the Christmas Agreement of 1942 united both groups of domestic resistance people, so communist and democratic. And the main idea they got was to help the Red Army to cross the Carpathian Mountains and to come to help us. The government of the Slovak state had a lot of problems to avoid the partisan campaigns because the Slovak troops that were sent to oppress these partisan campaigns usually joined the partisan groups themselves because of that Germany did not trust the Slovak government to manage the situation because of that they wanted to deal with the situation in Slovakia themselves but the resistance started to plan the uprising and there were two plans plan A and plan B. Plan A meant that the uprising will break out after everything would be prepared and plan B had to count with possible problems. So plan B considered the possibility that the plan A would be revealed at any phase or stage of its development and the economic preparation for this possibility was prepared by Karvaš and Zaďko, who were the economists who were transferring the finances from Bratislava to Banska Bystrica. Banska Bystrica was center of the uprising. Okay? So I just want you to remember that there were plan A and plan B. Plan A, everything would go well, and B, it could be revealed. And also the center was Banska Bystrica. So the uprising was in preparation, and meanwhile, the German military mission that traveled from Romania to Germany was killed in Vrutki. And as a reaction to that, the Wehrmacht, so the German army, started to occupy Slovak territory and many Slovak garrisons had to surrender. So we can say that this was the signal for uprising. So under the circumstances, the Slovak national uprising was activated as the plan B and started on August 29, 1944 by the radio announcement of Jan Golian Začnite s vysťahovaním. Okay, so I want you to remember that. Uprising was activated as the plan B. I want you to remember the date and also that announcement. Začnite s vysťahovaním. Slovak national uprising was activated by Slovak National Council that was like the secret government and it declared itself the only rightful government that wanted to restore the Czechoslovak Republic. Okay? So it was not the government of the Slovak state. Slovak National Council was just the secret government that wanted to restore the Czechoslovak Republic. However, there were organization problems because the uprising was activated as the plan B, so it was not fully prepared. So, these problems were that there was poor equipment and not enough supplies. Slovak National Council asked the USSR to speed up the Karpat Duklin operation to free the eastern border, okay? Because of course, the USSR was coming from the east. The Battle of Dukla Pass was one of the biggest in Slovakia. 
season of the past by the Soviets and the first Czechoslovak army corps was not the end and the fighting spread to the eastern Slovakia, so there was heavy fighting. The Free Oaks Airport in Sliac was the strategic point, so like air bridge, through which the United States of America and the USSR supported the uprising and many partisans were also from abroad, so for example the French partisans were helping us in the battles of Strechno and also garrisons from many other countries. The Slovak forces consisted of 18,000 partisans and 60,000 mobilized soldiers were led by Jan Golian and Rudolf Vies, so these two were generals. And they defended Banska Bystrica, but it fell on October 27, 1944, after heavy fights and the commanders Jan Golian and Rudolf Vies were arrested. Both of them died in 1945 in German concentration camp Flossenburg. As a reaction to the Slovak national uprising, more than 60 villages were burnt. Niemiecka, Ostrigun, Klak, Balaže, Tokajik, Kremnička, Mladonia, these are only examples, but there were many of them. Takže, čo si musíte pamätať z tohto? Je jedine Vianočná dohoda v roku 1943, ktorá spojila obevetví odboja, že na povstanie boli dve plány, plán A, plán B, Aktivovaný bol plán B kvôli, kvôli teda tým udalostiam, ktoré sa stali pri vrútkach a preto bolo povstanie aktivované dňa 29. augusta 1944 oznámením v rádiu Jánom Golianom začnite s vysťahovaním. Stalo sa tak v Banskej Bystrici. Povstanie bolo riadené tajnou ilegálnou Slovenskou národnou radou, ktorá sa vyhlásila za jediný správny orgán. Boli samozrejme nejaké organizačné problémy, ale povstanie ďalej pokračovalo. Červená armáda vnikla na územie Slovenska cez Karpatoduklianský priesmik, po teda Karpatoduklianskej operácii. Boli tu jedni z najťažších bojov práve na východnom Slovensku. Zásobovanie bolo riešené cez letisko Tri Duby v Sliači. A napriek tomu, že Slovenské vojska boli vedené Janom Golianom a Rudolfom Viestom. Banská Bystrica padla 27. oktobra po ťažkých bojoch a teda títo dvaja generáli boli zajatí a neskôr zabití v koncentračných táboroch. Ako reakcia 60 dedín bolo vypálených. To je všetko, čo potrebujete vedieť o Slovenskom národnom povstaní aspoň zatiaľ. So I will move on. Do I have some pictures? This is the presentation I have for the law students, so some of you will see next year. So the page 248 is just about the process of liberation of Czechoslovakia. So what happened after the Red Army crossed the Carpathian Mountains and was already in our territory? So there was fighting, bridges were detonated by retreating forces, railways and roads destroyed, the territory was bombed and so on, but our territory was finally liberated in the end of the April. Okay, I will not mention some other things from that, it's not important for now. Just when we were liberated by the Red Army from the USSR, it's obvious that this liberation brought the Soviet influence. So they later used the help during the Slovak National Uprising as an excuse for the control of our territory. Okay, so this is the only thing you need to remember. So the liberation by the Red Army brought the Soviet influence to our territory. So we will move finally to the Czechoslovak Republic. So what happened after our territory was already liberated was that all of the people that had something to do with the previous regime that was like clear fascist were deported or they were arrested and captured. Like for example the spearheads of the Slovak state like Tiso, Mach and Tuka. So they were arrested in Vienna and they were brought to Slovakia for the justice. Apart from these collaborants, political parties like Hlinka Slovak People's Party and Agrarian Party in the Bohemia were forbidden because you know they were the totalitarian party so the only one ruling party was for example Hasselosa. So that's why it was forbidden, you know, because it was criminal. Okay? So people arrested, political parties 
that ruled during the war were forbidden and controversial Spanish decrees were issued. According to these decrees, the Germans and Hungarians lost their citizenship, were deported and their property was confiscated. The Hungarians had a little better position, so this means that they could stay if they had one grandparent Slovak, okay? but all of the Germans had to leave the Czechoslovakia and also the Hungarians that did not have one grandparent Slovak, at least. Also, Czechoslovak Republic nationalized the main branches of economy. They established plurality, but it was on the way to socialism, because as I mentioned, the liberation by the Red Army brought the Soviet influence. And this was shown in the elections 1946, that was the first post-war election, and this was won by the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in general, but in Slovak part, the Democratic Party won, because of the Slovak Christian tradition. So former voters of Linka Slovak's People's Party voted Democrats. So we know the Slovaks and Czechs were a lot alike, but still there were some differences. So the first elections in 1946 won by the Communist Party and the new Prime Minister was Klement Gottwald. Takže opäť po vojne a po oslobodení Červenou armádou, ktorá priniesla sovietský vplyv, boli všetci kolaboranti deportovaní, zajatí, odsúdení, medzi nimi aj hlavní predstavitelia bývalého režimu počas vojny, čiže Tiso, Mach a Tuka. Hlinková slovenská ľudová strana a takisto agrárna strana v Českej časti Novej republiky boli zakázané pre bývalú spoluprácu teda s týmito vojnovými režimami. Benešové dekréty boli vydané podľa ktorých teda Nemci a aj Maďari, ktorí nemali aspoň jedného starého rodiča Slováka, takisto deportovaní, stratili Československé štátne občianstvo a ich majetok bol skonfiškovaný štátom. Znárodnené boli aj niektoré odvetvia hospodárstva, bola zavedená pluralita politických strán, ale stále sme boli na ceste k socializmu. To sa ukázalo v prvých voľbách po vojne v roku 1946, kedy v celoštátnych voľbách vyhralo, če, vyhrala komunistická strana Československa, ale v slovenskej časti najviac hlasov získala demokratická strana. To bolo preto, že slovenskí voliči, ktorí boli aj bývalými voličmi HSLS, mali vritú kresťanskú tradíciu a teda báli sa, že komunisti nebudú naklonení ich viere. Ale ako som povedala, v celoštátnych voľbách vyhrali komunisti a novým premiérom sa stal Clement Gottwald. And the next important thing I will mention is the communist takeover of 1948, because so far we were only on the way to socialism. So there was the growing influence of the USSR and also the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and this caused the refusal of the Marshall Plan that was the help given by the United States of America to Europe but we had to refuse it because the USSR dictated us to do so. And the 1947 crop failure was solved by the Soviet grain. So they sent us the grain instead of the Marshall Plan. In 1947, also another important thing happened, and this was the execution of Josef Tiso, and it was a political act. You know, Bohemian majority was for his execution, because they were voters of communists, but the Slovak majority was for the life sentence, so the long-term imprisonment. So these were voters of the Democratic Party. Why was that so? We know that Josef Tiso was criminal, but the Slovaks were Christians, you know, and that's why they didn't believe in the capital punishment because they still believe that, you know, a person can change. And also, Josef Tiso was a priest, so it was very unethical to them to kill the priest, you know, so that's why they had different opinions on this problem. So the communists wanted to compromise the Democrats by showing their electors that they were not able to avoid the capital punishment for Tiso. So they misused his execution as a political game played on the electorate of the Democratic Party. And this exactly happened. The communists violated many, many agreements continuously. For example, one minister, Václav Nosek, illegally extended his power in the national police force. To that, other non-communist members of the cabinet resigned, but they hoped that President Benesh will not accept their resignations. 
the communists started to organize their own demonstrations as a reaction to this and when President Bennett was under the pressure of the communist demonstrations general strike and march in communist people's militia that was like communist military unit he accepted ministers resignations and also Gottwald's proposal and appointed new government and by this on February the 25th 1948 Czechoslovakia became a totalitarian state. Zopakujem. Keďže vyhrali komunisti vo voľbách a už predtým sme tu mali sovietský vplyv, sovietský zväz nás donútil neprijať Marshallov plán, ktorý bol finančná pomoc pre európske krajiny, namiesto toho nám poslal zrno, ktoré bolo dovezené z Ukrajiny. Mimochodom, v Ukrajine potom nastal veľký hladomor, len preto, aby sovieti mohli poslať toto zrno teda svojim satelitom, nielen nám, ale aj Poliakom, Maďarom a vyhľadovali jednu zo svojich republik preto, aby ostatné republiky od nich neodišli a tak si udržali svoj vplyv. Ďalšia dôležitá vec, ktorá sa stala v tom istom roku, bola poprava Jozefa Tisa. Bez ohľadu na to, že išlo o vojnového zločinca, jeho poprava bola zneužitá ako politický akt. Česká väčšina bola za jeho popravu, pretože volila aj komunistov, ktorí chceli hlavne túto popravu. Slovenská väčšina bola skôr za doživotie. Bolo to aj kvôli tomu, že teda volili demokratickú stranu, boli, ako som povedala, nábožne založení, čiže boli automaticky proti trestu smrti. Plus teda Jozef Tiso bol čňaz a teda to tvoril etický problém, že nechceli popraviť takéhoto človeka, ešte najvyššie kniaza. Komunisti to zneužili ako politickú hru a tým, že Jozefaty sa popravili, pretože boli pri moci, ukázali voličom demokratov, že títo boli s ním neschopní s touto popravou niečo urobiť. Komunisti okrem tohto zneužívali aj iné dohody a vlastne ilegálne si rozširovali svoje právomoci, napríklad ako Václav Nosek v zbore národnej bezpečnosti. 12 nekomunistických členov kabinetu rezignovalo, teda dúfali, že tým iba dosiahnu nejakú zmenu, ale to sa nestalo. Prezident Beneš bol pod veľkým tlakom, pretože komunisti začali demonštrovať a aj kvôli sovietskému vplyvu tieto rezignácie akceptoval a menoval novú vládu. Stalo sa tak 25. februára 1948. Prosím vás, pamätať si, aspoň február 48. Dobre? Asp- aj ten mesiac chcem. Čiže vtedy sa stalo Československo socialistickým štátom. Tento deň označujeme za tzv. víťazný február. So victorious February. Okay, that is important. The next thing I will mention is the situation during the 1950s because that period was the very essence of the Czechoslovak communism. So during that period the nationalization was happening, also collectivization, command economy, fighting against class enemies, actions, black barons, labor camps, and show trials. So you need to know something about all of these things. So nationalization means when industry or company was put under the control of the government. So the government is the owner of the industrial company. Collectivization is very similar, but it's joining several private farms or industries together So it creates like the bigger farm or company. Napríklad tzv. JRD, jednotné rolnícke družstva, ktoré sa vytvárali z viacerých týchto súkromných fariem. Command or plant economy was when production, prices and incomes were decided and fixed by the central government. Class enemy was a person in opposition to the official regime and there was hunt on these class enemies. Actions was the liquidation of the monastic rules, action K was for the monks and action R for nuns. Black barons were soldiers of the Czechoslovak people's army who were not trusted because of their origin, so they were clerks, aristocrats or capitalists. Labor camps was placed when the undesirables were re-educated and the most famous was, for example, uranium mine in Yachimov. Čiže znárodňovanie je prejdenie nejakého majetku do 
pod správu štátu. Kolektivizácia je vlastne zjednotenie nejakých priemyslov alebo fariem do takých väčších celkov, ktoré sú takisto riadené štátom. Riadená plánovaná ekonomika, vy to poznáte veľmi dobre z hodín ekonomiky, máte ponuku a dopyt. V dnešnej trhovej ekonomike to funguje tak, že podľa toho, o čo majú spotrebitelia záujem, čiže aký je dopyt, podľa toho sa prispôsobuje ponuka. V plánovanej ekonomike je to tak, že sa vytvorí ponuka a na základe toho sa dopyt musí prispôsobiť. To znamená, že nemôžete si kúpiť nič, čo na trhu nie je. Triedný nepriateľ bol hoci kto, kto bol v opozícii režimu a bol na nich teda taký lov na čarodejnice. Akcie bola likvidácia kláštorov a reholí, bola akcia K, teda na kláštory a akcia R na reholničky rehole. Nísi sa často posielali na nejaké stavby, čiže na takú prevýchovú fyzickou prácou. Z nížky posielali starať sa o chorých, postihnutých alebo chudobných ľudí. Čierni baróni boli vojaci, ktorí boli takisto predtým triedy nepriateľia, môžeme povedať, či napríklad kapitalisti, buržoázia alebo možno nejakí ako kolaboranti, demokrati a tak ďalej. Pracovné tábory slúžili na prevychovanie týchto triedných nepriateľov. Najslavnejší bol Jachimo a tam teda išlo o bane na urán. Čiže to bolo veľmi kruté. V podstate väčšina tých aj, ktorí prežili túto prevýchovu, neskôr zomrela na rakovinu ako dôsledok tohto. The next thing are the show trials. So the show trials are just made up trials. And this was happening mostly during the era of Stalinism and it was very absurd because it was only organized to threat people for political reasons and not for finding the truth and led to death of 248 people. The best known trials are these two, process with Milada Horakova and monster process. Milada Horakova was executed for high treason and espionage. Of course, she didn't commit high treason and espionage, it was just made up. And monster process was led with members of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. So there were many motives to get rid of the opponents in the own political party. Eleven of the accused were executed, for example, Vladimir Klementis and Rudolf Slansky. And there were others sentenced to long-term imprisonments, for example, Gustav Husak and Ladislav Novomesky. The very cruel thing about these show trials was that these victims were not even buried because their ashes were just scattered at the field near Prague because the communists didn't want the graves of the executed martyrs of communism to become memorials. And this regime caused directly death of 6,000 people So these people were shot when they wanted to emigrate to cross the border. So they died when they wanted to cross the Morava River, so they drowned. Or they died because of border electric fences and many others personally experienced the injustice of the totalitarian regime when they stayed in the Republic. Čiže išlo o procesy, ktoré mali dopredu daný výsledok, takže boli úplne vykonštruované. Dva najznámejšie boli teda s Milanou Horákovou a potom vlastne s členmi komunistickej strany. Boli úplne vykonštruované a ako som povedala, dokonca ich hroby nikde nenájdete. Čiže ich popol bol iba rozsypaný niekde pri Prahe. Niektorým popolom niektorých popravených ľudí boli dokonca vydláždené pražské ulice. Čiže aj tento režim bol naozaj brutálny. Musíme sa zmieniť aj o horor komunistického režimu a nie len o horor fašistického režimu. Takže boli si v tomto aj pomerne rovnocenné. After the 50s, the event that we call the Prague Spring happened. The only important thing you need to know is that after this period of the show trials and actions and so on, one politician came into the politics. His name was Alexander Dubček, who wanted to establish the socialism with the human face. This means that he wanted to give the people freedom of the speech, freedom of assembly, private business, freedom of press, of movement, and possibility of pluralism, so the multi-party government. People of Czechoslovakia were really enthusiastic about this, but it sounded too good to be true. And so it was. After that, 
the USSR with its leader Leonid Brezhnev used the conservative communists like Vasil Bilak, they arranged the invitation that was just made up and they invited the Warsaw Pact forces to oppress the counter-revolution. So after these reforms that Alexander Dubček passed by the action program that established the socialism with the human face, the armies of the USSR, Hungary, the German Democratic Republic, so East Germany, Poland and Bulgaria invaded Czechoslovakia and in spite of Dubček's demand not to resist, there were around 100 people killed in the streets. And our country was occupied until the year 1991. Okay, so that's everything you need to know from this. So Alexander Dubček, socialism with the human face. So what reforms were passed and the invitation of the Warsaw Pact forces. Potom ako Alexander Dubček nastavil tieto zmeny ako sloboda prejavu, zhromažďovania, tlače, pohybu a dokonca možnosť pluralizmu, ľudia boli šťastní, ale skeptickí. A to sa potvrdilo, keď teda Sovietský zväz a Leonid Brežnev zorganizovali také náranžované pozvanie Vasilom Bilakom, že teda sa deje nejaká revolúcia a tu treba potlačiť. Takže tieto vojska prišli ako keby na pomoc, ale bolo to vykonštruované. A tieto vojska tu potom zostali od roku 1968 až do roku 1991. Pamätať si prosím vás, že sa to stalo v tomto roku 68. Prague Spring. Then I will tell you something about the normalization, because it was the period of the restoration, okay? after the Prague Spring. So during that period, for example, Jan Palach set himself on fire for the protest against the regime and the occupation of the Warsaw Pact forces. The dissent was formed. Dissident is someone who strongly disagrees with and criticizes the government, especially in a country where this kind of action is dangerous. Okay, so the dissident opposed the system of government and criticized the violation of the human rights in communist Czechoslovakia. This dissidents signed famous Charter 77. The most important representative was Václav Havel, but the government organized the anti-charter that was signed by the writers, actors, musicians and other artists. By their fake loyalty, the government wanted people remain passive and quiet, and this was successful. The symbol of this era was, for example, famous car, Škoda 100, of the blocks of flats that were built by state. Čiže len vám poviem, dôležitá vec, vedieť, že v roku 1969 sa upálil Jan Palach, 21-ročný študent histórie, na protest proti okupácie Československa a jeho pohreb sa stal jednou z najväčších demonstrácií proti okupácii a proti režimu. V 70. rokoch sa sformoval dissent a teda vznikli disidenti. Chcem, aby ste vedeli, kto to boli, čiže ľudia, ktorí kritizovali režim a podnikali nejaké akcie proti nemu a teda bolo to ilegálne. Títo disidenti podpísali Chartu 77, ktorá sa dožadovala dodržiavania ľudských práv v Československu. Proti tomuto vznikla tzv. anticharta, Čiže režim donútil umelcov podpísať tento dokument a využil ich v podstate ako napríklad nejakých influencerov, celebrity, tak aby ostatní ľudia takisto zostali pasívni a tichí a teda tomu režimu sa podvolili, keď vidia, že aj ich vzory súhlasia s režimom. Symboly tejto doby sú napríklad škodovka stovka alebo typické paneláky a sídliska, ktoré boli v tejto dobe stavané. Okay, and the last, very last thing is the Velvet Revolution, but I will not talk about this again because we already had this lecture, okay? So I will just tell you what you need to know. So it's the Candle Manifestation in 1988, organized by Mikloško and Chaimogurski. This was demonstration that desired religious freedom in Czechoslovakia. Then the next demonstrations were during the week of Palach, when there was the anniversary of this student's self-immolation, what is basically like that he burned himself alive. Decent illegally published program, few sentences, via Samizdat and 
radio station, so it was spread by these means. The demonstration on the students' day turned into the demonstration against the regime. So it was on the November the 17th, 1989, so remember that day. And this was the official beginning of the Velvet Revolution. The name is an oxymoron. Oxymoron means that these are two words that are totally opposite. So Velvet Revolution. Velvet means mild, non-violent, and revolution is usually violent because it overthrows some kind of regime. The main representatives were Kniazhko, Felde, Glango, Shimechka, Budai, Gal, Zayat, Butora, Filkova, for example. And these demonstrations really overthrew the regime. And after this, the first free elections were in 1990 and the new president was Václav Havel. After that, Democratic Czechoslovakia was established. It was called Czechoslovak Federative Republic between the years 1990 and 1992. After that, Czechoslovakia was dissolved and the Slovak Republic was created on the 1st of January 1993. And after that, we had two era, Mitchell's era and Zurinda's era. So I hope you have some information about this. So the Mitchell's era was basically about the isolation, autocracy, connection between the politicians and criminals and privatization. So during this period many of the scandals happened. I would just mention murder of Robert Remiage or kidnapping of President Kovac's son. So these were very traumatic events for the Republic. After that during this era came and it was quite reforming and even though there were some scandals as well Slovakia became the member of NATO and European Union in 2004 and this is very important for us and this is where I will stop Čiže len vám rýchlo zopakujem dôležité vedieť že teda najprv bola tá sviečková manifestácia že išlo teda o dožadovanie sa náboženskej slobody v Československu. Potom to boli demonstrácie na Medzinárodný deň študentstva, ktoré sa zmenili na protesty proti režimu v 17. novembra. Tieto demonstrácie dosiahli svoje. V roku 1990 boli prvé slobodné voľby, ktoré vyhral Václav Havel a teda demokratické strany. Dva roky sme žili, vo, žili v demokratickej republike, stále Československej, volala sa Československá federatívna republika. A po týchto dvoch rokoch sa naše cesty rozišli kvôli rôznym názorom na rôzne odvetvia. Napriek tomu, že bežní ľudia neboli za toto rozdelenie, vládnuce strany nevedeli nájsť kompromis a tak sme sa vlastne takisto bez násilia rozišli. Slovenská republika vznikla 1. januára 1993 a po nej sme mali dve obdobia. Mečiarová vláda a potom Zurindová vláda. Počas Mečiarovej éry sa teda udialo viacero škandálov, ktoré som spomenula, ako teda únos prezidentovho syna alebo vražda Roberta Remiáša. Určite ste o týchto veciach počuli, pokiaľ nie, dohľadajte si. A potom teda Zurindová vláda, počas ktorej sa Slovensko posunulo ďalej aj v ekonomike. A najdôležitejšia vec je, že sa zapojilo do NATO a Európskej únie v roku 2004. A pot- tam končí naša história. K veciam, ktoré sa stali neskôr, nemáme ešte dostatočný odstup, takže toto je posledná vec, ktorou skončíme tento ročník. Takže ja vám prajem veľmi veľa šťastia do uh, Big Testu. Pokiaľ by ste niečomu nerozumeli, máte týždeň čas, kedy môžete so mnou hocičo prediskutovať. Viem, že to bolo tak Najrýchlo, ale budem sa pýtať naozaj len na tie najdôležitejšie veci. Takže nebojte sa, keby ste niečo potrebovali, viete, ako ma môžete kontaktovať. The last thing, I want to thank you for your cooperation for the whole year and wish you the best of luck for the test. Bye!